Hey everyone and good day to all. Um, welcome to our art history and this is the first lesson for week three. So I know that I have presented last time that week two is for the uh, first lesson uh, but since I have somehow encountered some technical issues I have to move it to week three but nonetheless, I'll be adjusting the other topics um, so we can fit all the topics from prehistory to renaissance for this whole semester or first semester. So let's proceed now. So our lesson for today or for this week is about prehistoric art. So here you see examples of uh, images of the prehistoric art. Now, before I further proceed, though, let me just lay down the lesson objectives for this week or for this lesson. So you will be able to extend your skills in identifying and describing prehistoric works of art by analyzing them. And then you'll be able to learn more of our history through engaging content. And then also you'll be able to develop strong writing skills when describing, analyzing, and comparing prehistoric works of art. And lastly is you'll be able to cultivate an appreciation for the different prehistoric arts and tools through written tasks. So let's begin. So what does the word prehistory means? So from its prefix pre, meaning beginning or before. Um, so the prehistoric art, is actually art that is produced in pre-literate and pre-historical cultures. So when you say pre-literate, pre uh, that is something relating to a society or culture that has not developed the use of writing, or um, yeah, not developed the use of writing yet. Now for prehistoric or prehistorical, it's something relating to the period before um, written works. So they are synonymous to each other. So uh, this is the time wherein no written or form of writing is still present. Now for this um, prehistoric um, period, there are it's actually divided into three stages. Um, I'm sure you are familiar with this one already. Um, what is the first age called? So that would be the Stone Age. Now, the Stone Age is also divided into three distinct periods. Paleolithic period or the Old Stone Age, Mesolithic period or the Middle Stone Age, and Neolithic period or the New Stone Age. So let's begin with the Stone Age. So why is it called the Stone Age? Well, of course, as the word says stone, so what's widely used at that time is stone to make their tools. And this period actually ra um, lasted roughly 3.4 million years and ended 3000 BCE. Now you see the term here BCE. Um, let's try to explain that. So BCE, that actually um, also refers to BC. And then you may encounter as well CE, which is referring to AD. So they are of the same use. So BC was, um, it's before Christ and BC is, is before common era. And then CE is common era and AD is the Anno Domini or in the year of the Lord. So when we use dating system, it's somehow safe to say um, or use the BCE and the CE if you are not referring to any religious um, theme or religious topics. But if you are referring to those stuff, religious, then you can use BC and AD. So you will see mostly um, dating systems used on this um, topic or the rest of the topics would be BCE and CE. And the other terms that you need to be familiar with is or are pictograph and petroglyph. So what's the difference? When you say pictograph, it's a painting on a surface like a cave wall. So it uses pigments, while petroglyph, it's a design carved into rock or other surface. So it is carved or engraved. So that's the difference. So pictograph again, it's something that is painted and petroglyph is something that is carved or engraved. 
So let's go through now the Old Stone Age, or again, it's Paleolithic period. So it's 30,000 BCE to 10,000 BCE. So it came from two terms, uh, two words, paleo and lithos. Paleo means old and lithos means stone. So that's why it's called Old Stone Age. So the people in this time are called nomadic because they move from one place to another depending on the availability of um, the food um, and the commodities that are present in a certain area or location. So once they, um, since they are nomadic, so they dwell or stay in temporary caves and open pits. So the main focus of this um, prehistoric people are uh, is survival. So whatever they do is for survival solely. And aside from that, uh, they are also, um, they believe in spirits. So since this is um, prehistoric or pre-literate period, so there is no formal religion yet. And also, uh, the, the stone tools that they use, they are chipped off, meaning um, they, the, the stone is being breaked off at the edges to use as their tool, equipment, or their weapon. And also, as part of their survival, uh, they are mainly hunter-gatherers. So they hunt for food, and they gather for food as well, like berries, nuts, um, plants, and other um, things that they can eat for their meal. So let's talk more about their art at that time. So there were actually two kinds of art. So art was either portable or stationary. And both of these are limited in scope since um, it's still the Stone Age. So when you say portable art, from the word itself, portable, it can be carried around. So the, the art forms at the time were very small or necessarily small, so they can be carried around whenever they move from one location to the other. And so their art forms are consisted of either figurines or decorated objects like engravings on pieces of stones, amulets, and or talismans. So these things are carved from stone, bone, or antler. So when you say antler, it's like the uh, horns of the adult deer. Yeah. So this portable art form can also be said as figurative, meaning uh, something is recognizable from it, either if it's um, an animal or in a human form. So this, most of these figurines are collectively known as Venus, the word or name Venus itself, as they are obviously females of childbearing build. So speaking of Venus, let's talk about sculpture. So here is an example of a Venus figurine. So Venus of, Venus of Holfels. So this is the earliest known, undisputed example of a depiction of a human being in prehistoric art. So it is carved in mammoth ivory and it only measures six centimeters or 2.4 inches. So if you would take out your um, ruler, try to measure 2.4, and imagine how small it is. So 2.4, less than two and a half inches only. And another example of the Venus is the Venus of Losel. It's a carving and it is carved on a large block of limestone. So earlier it's made of ivory. This one is made of limestone. And the most famous one, Venus of Willendorf. It's only, it's also small. It's only 4.4 inches, so just a little bigger than the Venus of Holofels. So this one is made of limestone. Now here is a picture of the different views um, or how you will be able to look at the Venus of Willendorf, the, the front part, the profile view, and then the back view. So if you hold it or like imagine holding it on your hands, so that's how small it is. And here, did you know that there are a lot of Venus figures actually, and it is in different locations. So there are over 144 of Venus figures that were discovered and they are all around the same um, time. 
although they are like different uh, materials also, um, like different figures somehow, but there are similarities with the exaggerated um, chest, buttocks, waist that would symbolize fertility. So that's how the Venus figures are. So exaggerated features for the chest, the hips, and the buttocks, which are representation of fertility. So they are small, so they can be carried around since they are nomadic. And again, they are made of stone, bone, and ivory. So here is just um, a funny comic I've uh, seen online. So it's about uh, two cavemen. One is a hunter-gatherer and one is doing a cave art. So somehow the, um, the other caveman is uh, inviting the other person to be a hunter-gatherer also instead of painting. So speaking of painting, let's go to the cave art. So the cave art is the example of a stationary art. So the sculptures were the portable art. So this time we, we talk about we will talk about stationary, which means it doesn't move. So something that doesn't move from the word stationary itself. So the best example are the paintings in Western Europe, most especially. And they were um, painted using a combination of minerals, burnt bone and charcoal mixed into water, blood, animal fats, and even tree saps. So here is an example of a cave art in Indonesia. Uh, it's uh, hand stencils and also another hand stencils from Cosker Cave in France and in Argentina. But aside from that, we also have other cave paintings in France, um, most especially Lascaux. This is just a part of the cave. It's named as Hall of Bulls, because you can see there, there are a lot of animals, mostly bulls, or they call it Orak. So um, a species of bulls or cattle. And also they um, painted horses as well, but mostly bulls. The same with um, a cave in Chauvet. So they are, there are paintings of animals. Here are other animals that can be seen on Chauvet Cave. And also here, this time it's kind of different because um, it shows a human figure. So this is in fine detail with accurate anatomical proportioning somehow. So this is the Bradshaws and it's dated 70,000, 17,000 years old. This is in Western Australia. We also have in Spain, um, Cavo Altamira. So you can see it's still animals with hand stencils still. So characteristics as you have shown with the examples, um, figures are always in profile. So side view mostly, and they are of contour lines only, um, painted in natural earth colors like ochres, reds, and blacks. So uh, the figures are somehow, aside from profile, they are anatomically accurate at that time. And the composition are mostly overlapping or juxtaposition, so somehow side by side. So there are, you, as you have noticed, there are no ground line and no landscape. And mostly uh, depictions of animals only, less of humans. So with the animals, you can see the bison, aurochs, um, rhinos, deer, elk, and horses. So that's for the cave art or their painting. Let's go now to their dwellings or their architecture. So their dwellings, since they are nomadic again, um, their dwellings are temporary, but they have built them or constructed them for shelter and protection from um, extreme weather conditions because it's still the ice age and also against um, wild beasts and enemies. So the structures were made of wood and stone and these buildings or structures were only for their dwellings. Uh, I mean, their shelter and protection only, no special purposes. Like, for example, the caves. So the caves are the most 
um, common and the oldest type of dwellings that our prehistoric people live in. So these are natural underground um, spaces, large enough for a human or for a group of people. And they can be in either rock shelters, grottos, or sea caves. So this is an example of a cave in Altamira, Spain. But they, they also have huts, which are oval in shape. Um, they have discovered that these are built close to seashores. Uh, there are stones as supports and also posts. And the floor is made of organic matter and ash. Aside from huts, they have pit houses. Pit houses are um, constructed by making shallow depressions in the ground surrounded by a ring of mammoth bones and tusks. So aside from um, wood and stone, they also build houses or dwellings uh, made of bones and tusks. So pit houses are somehow dug um, in the ground and it's only half dug. Um, it's a protection against severely um, inclement or, ex or extreme weather and also from predators. Uh, we also have the meseric or meserich. So it's made of large, uh, long bones and skulls and mammoth jaws. And also Mol Molodova, same thing, tusk and bones. And the Dolni Vesto Nietzsche or Vesto Nietzsche. So the Dolni, this is just a uh, reconstructed image of how this um, shelter would look like during that time. So these different names are actually um, dependent on where they were located. So any questions so far? If you do, uh, make sure to notate or note them down so we can discuss them during our Google meeting. So let me proceed now to the next period, which is the Mesolithic. So Middle Stone Age. So this is just a rep this representational picture of the changes already in Mesolithic period. So also come from two words, meso and lithos. So meso meaning middle and lithos meaning stone. So this time, uh, this is already like the post-glacial events. So this is after ice age somehow. So the climate is a little warmer already, but there is still instability and permanent settlements are beginning to form. So they are no longer purely nomadic and they are beginning to also um, use farming tools and their dwellings, since they are not moving much anymore, their dwellings are more durable already. And then also, as, um, since they are using farming tools, they are now learning to um, domesticate animals. They learn how to fish and they are now hunting in groups. And one more thing, the concept of cemeteries has been created already. Remember with Paleolithic period, um, the, shel the dwellings are mostly for just shelter and protection, no special purposes. This time in this period, they are starting to create um, structures or dwellings that have a different purpose. So let's start with their uh, painting or cave art during this time. So this one here is a rock engraving in Cave of Adora, Sic Sicily. So you can see there it's not painted, it's engraved. So a group of figures and um, as you notice, it's a group of um, people instead of animals. But they do still have, but there are still um, cave art which have animal figures, but this time it's incorporating already um, a little more human figures. So here is a painting of men and animals in India. So if you've noticed as well, Mesolithic art is somewhat geometric already and the colors are more red ochre only. And aside from that, there are other, um, some notable small figures or art items as well. Here are the painted stones or pebbles. And this one could be um, like an ornament because you can see there is a loop or a hole, uh, which may symbolize it's something that it is hung or um, decorated. 
So again, for cave paintings, so aside from geometric, it's the use of red ochre is very present and inclusion of human figures. So notable um, Mesolithic developments would be painted pebbles, like earlier there, and stone beads, pierced shells, and teeth and amber adornments. So let's go to sculpture. Now we have here is an example of a sculpture, which is a moose head. It's a figurine made, uh, made from soap stone. It's a soft rock consisting largely of talc, which was found in 1903. So it's a, a moose or an elk's head. And we also have here, this is a mysterious uh, type of sculpture. It is the Shigir sculpture idol, as you can see. It's um, a tall or a longer um, sculpture compared to just the other sculptures. Remember our Paleolithic, it's just smaller ones, two to four inches only, figurines. This one here, it's uh, something different. Now, if you'll be able to um, see it up close, this is how it would look, especially the head, different views of the head and some parts of its um, body. So you can see there, uh, there are engravings or carvings. And this um, Shigir sculpture is actually the oldest known wooden sculpture in the world. So it was found um, in the Mesolithic period. And they said that the idol is three times as old as the Egyptian pyramids. Now, um, it is said as well that this Shigir sculpture is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of mysterious. Because up until now, the carvings or the engravings that you can see there on, on the body and even the impression on the face or the head, um, there is no exact um, study or interpretation yet of what they mean. Each part of this body here from top to bottom, the carvings or the engravings that you see there. Um, somehow there are no exact interpretation yet of what they mean. Because um, according to our archaeologists or historians, there is no other sculpture that could be similar or can be said that it's similar to this one. So this is a very unique kind of sculpture. So they even said that it's something demonic or evil in nature of the face or the head. Um, but according to Dr. Mikael Zilling, um, an archaeologist or historian, he thinks that the markings on the idol are more of a message to ancient spirits. Remember, there is no religion yet, but they believe in um, spirits. So possibly this is some kind of an adoration for a deity or a spirit instead of something that is evil or demonic. All right, so that's it for the sculpture. So let's proceed to their architecture as well. So um, as I mentioned um, on the first part, there is already a formation of cemeteries. So structures are no longer just for um, their shelter and protection or dwellings. So there is a start already of burial or cemeteries, but they do still have huts, of course. Um, as their dwellings and pit houses are still present as well. Any questions so far though before I proceed? All right. Okay, so those that was for the Mesolithic. Now let's proceed to the third stage or age of the uh, Stone Age. So this is New Stone Age or Neolithic. All right, so this is um, a, a picture of what supposedly Neolithic um, age or period would have looked like compared to Paleolithic and Mesolithic. So you can see that they are permanently settled already. There are animals with them and they have, um, they are already farming. So Neolithic age, this is actually known as 
the period in the development of human technology. So it comes from the two words neo and lithos. So neo means new and lithos, it means still stone. So new stone age. So here at this time, permanent year round settlements and villages already are present. So aside from hunting and gathering, um, people now had specialized jobs as weavers, potters, and farmers. So based on the picture here, so they are already farming. And since, since the Mesolithic period, um, there is already like special purposes or special kind of um, dwellings or structures. So there is now a presence of priests and shamans. And also herding, domestication of animals and organized agriculture is present. And then also their stone tools are more polished and there are already presence of metal tools. So let's talk about their painting or cave art as well. So this is an example of um, cave art in Turkey. Sorry, Turkey is small letter. It's supposed to be capital letter. So this is in Katal Huyuk. The title of the painting is Dancing Hunter. And also um, another part of the cave is a mural showing the hind part of the O rocks, a deer, and hunters. So there is the presence of animals and also humans in the cave art. So here is the hind part of the O rock. And we have here the deer and then the hunters. So the auroch is predicted as something, so uh, an animal that is large or, or huge. So here is another part of uh, cave painting. And also here. So um, you can see there, hunters attacking an auroch. This is in the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations. So this is the auroch, the head of the auroch. It's too big compared to the sizes of the hunters. So if you can remember, um, people already are starting to hunt in groups. So here is supposedly how it would look like if it was a complete or um, if it was still, if you are still at that time. So you can see this large aura and the group of hunters there. And other people um, might be doing something else other than just hunting. And here is another also um, painting, cave painting. Uh, this time it's in Spain. Um, it's entitled The Dance of the Kogul. So it's a rock shelter containing paintings of prehistoric Levantine rock art. So still presence of animals and humans. Proceed now to sculpture or pottery. So you can see um, I have added pottery. You'll know later why. So here is a sculpture of um, entitled Mother Goddess. So you can still recognize its exaggeration of the form. It's, it's only a bottom piece of a larger statue. So you have there a large full legs, pleated skirt, the skirt here, and it's supposedly red paint. So um, it's a symbol still of childbirth, um, most especially the large exaggeration of form. It's still fertility or childbirth. Um, and then the round tombs, possibly symbolizing the womb. So it's still their sculpture of a female figure or still um, representation of fertility. But there is a difference already. So here is a thinker of Cernavota. It's a magnificent example of terracotta sculpture from this um, period or Neolithic era. So a thinker. So you can see here, it's no longer just female figure. So it's um, another form. It could be a male already um, who might be thinking something, sitting there and thinking of something. But we still have, of course, um, presence of female figures. So this one is another sculpture, Mother Goddess 
from Katahuyuk. It's a terracotta sculpture also, and it's already present in a uh, museum of Anatolian civilizations. So you can see here uh, still the presence of the same form of um, the Venuses, different Venus figures. But then you can see there's a difference already. There are two animal figures there. Uh, these are somehow felines uh, beside the female figure. Now here is the presence of the pottery. So this is a pottery from the um, this so-called late Ubaid period. And this style of pottery has been found in various sites along the coast of the Persian Gulf. Um, if you can recognize uh, from the other periods or ages, um, it's more of just figurines and stuff. But this time, uh, we can see now presence of pottery. So this is the first produced pottery used in this era, the Neolithic age. And uh, since there is already permanency and change in agriculture um, and then rise of settlements and villages, people at that time need to have a storage, uh, a storage equipment. So they have started making this um, pottery. So since they are somehow no longer nomadic compared to the Paleolithic and the ne uh, Mesolithic, with Neolithic period, they have already settled. So there is already um, a presence of a, a need to, stair, to, to store their food, water, and stuff for their um, daily needs. And aside from that, um, we also have here. This is a pottery, but this is more like um, a plate or a dish plate already. Since um, there is already this, they are, um, they, they, aside from storage, they need already, they're thinking of using something where they can eat properly already. So they need something for their consumption of food and beverages. So this type of pottery um, were already created. Now, uh, this is the hal Halafian or Halafian pottery. So when we say Halaf, it's, um, it's found around Turkey, Syria, or northern Mesopotamia. And the Ubaid period, it's in the southern Mesopotamia. So there is a great change already of the sculpture in this period compared to the other periods. Now, how about for the architecture? So for the architecture in Neolithic period, there is already a different purpose. So aside from the necessity of protection from inclement weather, they also have to fulfill their need to worship their gods. So they have, remember in Mesolithic, there are already cemeteries. So tombs are also present. So a lot of uh, different structures are already here for special purposes. Here is an example of um, a religious structure. So this is recognized as the oldest known human-made religious structure. This is in um, Turkey. Um, but aside from this one, we also still have stones stones are still present so megalith um this is an example of a megalith here is called men here it's a large man-made upright stone and can be found solely as monolith just one stone or a part of a group of similar stones so when you say lith uh, it's a standing stone We also have um, the Avebury Stone Circle. So this is one of the best known prehistoric sites in United Kingdom. It contains the largest stone circle in the whole of Europe. And its original purpose is actually somehow unknown or uncertain. Um, although based on um, theories or some beliefs, uh, this was actually used for a ritual or a ceremony. 
And we also have this Karnak stones. This now, now this one is for in France. Um, this is a dense collection of megalithic sites in France, consisting of stone alignments, dolmens, um, bureau mounds, and single menhirs or standing stones. Now, this is the aerial view of that Karnak stone. So you can see there, there are really a lot of stones. So again, this is like um, a ceremonial site. That's, um, yeah, it's a religious site. Now, these pictures are examples of how it would look like if uh, you are present there. Like you can compare the size of the humans to the size of the stones. Like here, this is an up close picture of one stone only. So you can see that um, and, and you can compare it here. So it is really bigger than the human figure. And we also have dolmens. So dolmens, uh, these are made of two or more upright stones with a single stone lying across them. So this is called um, post and lintel. So post, this is the vertical stones, and the lintel is the horizontal stones. This is also for um, ceremonial or ritual purposes. Another dolmen is the portal dolmen in Wales. So still the same, upright, and then the... Um, horizontal stone on top. So the portal dolmen, um, here's another example also. It actually indicates that um, same thing, there is a pair of stones standing upright and there is um, an upper stone that is horizontally placed on top of the um, upright ones or the post. So these dolmens are also somehow referred to as a passage grave. So it's a passage to a certain chamber around the area. So somehow the entrance siya, entrance to um, the whole ritual or ceremonial site. So that's possibly um, what our, our um, historians and archaeologists, archaeologists believe that this could be passage graves the whole um, ceremonial site. So like this one here, if this is like the uh, ceremonial site, so there is like an entrance or something like that. And also another example of the dolmen, this is in Ireland. So you can see the size of the stones. You can imagine how this was built or constructed, how large the stones are or how, how heavy they could have been. And the most famous one, the Stonehenge. So it's lib um, it is known as a cromlech. When you say cromlech, it's a megalithic construction made of large stone blocks um, or large stone circles, such as this one in Brittany, France, the Stonehenge. So this Stonehenge, it consists of a ring of standing stones, which are which is around um, 13 feet high and seven feet wide. So weighing around 25 tons each. The next one here is, this is um, the plan, uh, like a floor plan. So the plan of the stone hinge. So this is also um, somehow uh, a ritual for ritual purposes also, because according to archaeologists, they are uncertain um, whether this site is served as for funerary purposes, ritual purposes, or both. And another, another um, theory is that this um, stone hinge served as somehow like a calendar, astronomical calendar, to help the people at the time um, to know when to harvest or to identify what season they are in already. 
So just like, um, remember the men here? Here, uh, the men here, the megalith. Um, this was somehow believed as well, served like um, at like a calendar or a time. It's like a clock. Uh, this was somehow, maybe, maybe it was used as a clock because based on the shadow that it will cast on the ground whenever the sun rises until it uh, sets um, at night. So it can be somehow used like um, their, their watch or it could be their calendar. Same with the Stonehenge astronomical calendar. Since there are no calendars or numbers um, invented yet. So this is possibly the way they have understood the season and know when to harvest. Or know when to um, start planting and then harvesting. So just a summary of the Neolithic art and the architecture. So paintings, um, there is a simplified depiction of people and animals uh, already enjoyed or engaged in everyday activities. So not just like hunting, but possibly other activities as well, because there is domestication of animals. Some animals are living with the humans already. And there is um, a notable depiction of animals in flying gallop to give the illusion of movement. And then also, uh, remember the pottery? So pottery and weaving is already prevalent as well. So people are starting to dye wools and fibers for colored clothes. And then pots were more functional rather than ornamental. So remember, they are already finding ways to store their food and water. That's why there is pottery already. So the pots are the jars. And then the presence of plates for their consumption of their food. And then um, for the structures, so post and lintel. So the uh, vertical stones and then the horizontal stone on top of the two um, vertical ones. So here is just um, another summary of the three periods already, the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. So you can also go through that. So you can see uh, somehow the changes in each period already. So from nomadic to somehow settled to permanently settled. Now let's go to another age in the prehistory, the Metal Age. So this is just short. So we have the Bronze and the Iron Age. So the Bronze Age, well, of course, just the Stone Age, um, bronze is the most um, prominent uh, material. So there is a new medium of art already. And this Bronze Age began in Europe around uh, 3rd millennium BCE. So there are already presence of bronze tools, luxury goods, decorated weapons, and other objects without practical purpose. So this is maybe the start already of them thinking about creating something for just the purpose of display. And then um, there is already a creation of a class of artisans. So when you say artisans, these are um, uh, craft workers, um, artistic uh, uh, people with artistic skills who do or create handicrafts. So here is an example of an item. It's an uh, oxborough dirk. It's a large ceremonial weapon from the Bronze Age. So it's actually too heavy for a person to carry and use as a weapon. So it's mostly just for display. And here are other um, items or also present in the Bronze Age. So the mold cape. So this one is made of solid sheet gold object. So this was actually used for um, ceremonial. So this is just a part of a ceremonial dress. Um, and this is possibly for religious ceremonies. Uh, same with the golden hats. So this is a golden, uh, golden hats um, served as a religious insignia for the deities or the priests at the time. Um, this is found in Central Europe. So made of gold. So aside from bronze, there is a gold. So you can see the intricacy of how this um, K 
cape and these hats were, were made. Now for the Iron Age, so this is a development of anthropomorphic sculptures already, wherein non-human um, forms have the human uh, trait or human um, distinction already. So again, com the combination of the human characteristics to the non-human figure. This one here is uh, still geometric, but there's already um, abstract designs and mythical animals um, were a common motive. So the anthropomorphic sculptures, uh, this is where the mythical animals come in for the uh, motive. And then weaponry were decorated. And then megalithic art is still practiced, but uh, not that prominent already. So this here is an example of a gold shoe plaque um, in 530 BC. So this, is, this was found in Germany. Other notable um, artworks as well. The this one here is the La Tennis style, so intricacy is still present there. And then also the entrance stone in New Grange. This is a megalithic art. This is found in Ireland. So the bronze and the Iron Age are actually um, like improvement or development in the artistic styles already of our prehistoric people. All right. All right, so that's it for the prehistoric period. And now the biggest question is, how did the Flintstone, Flintstones exactly lived, right? So, um, even though there are already a lot of this um, evidences and artworks from our prehistoric time, um, we cannot exactly determine how um, these people have lived. We can only try to understand based on what we have found or archaeologists or historians found and maybe have some enlightenment of what possibly, of what possibly they have been doing or are doing and what their um, art would say about them and the message that they are trying to send to the next generation. Like for example, for cave paintings, you cannot actually, actually say what it means, why they have created those um, hand stencils or the paintings of the animals, right? Because um, it might say that those paintings are uh, a symbol of, or it could say something like they were present there, or possibly it's a message that um, it would say to other generations or other um, uh, group of people that may come or go to that um, cave. It would be a message that says the animals, this type of animals are present there, or it would just simply say they were there and this is what they did. So something like that. So there is no exact interpretation of what those paintings um, or even this, the, the sculptures also mean or um, the exact meaning of why they were created. Because um, if there was someone who was, still pre who was present there and still living, that's, that's definitely um, uh, something that's uh, mysterious or ridiculous. But anyway, so um, at least we have our historians and archaeologists, our archaeologists who were able to uh, decipher and find these objects, um, these art pieces that mean something about our history. So what about the Flintstones? <laughs> How did they live during the this prehistoric time? Which is an icebreaker though. Um, did you know that the Flintstones I'm not sure if you have already watched this or have seen this, but this um, cartoons was actually aired in the 1960s and was originally meant for adults to watch instead of children because it was aired at 8.30 p.m., which at the time was after bedtime already for the kids. So you think bedtime is like um, 
now compared to now, like 9, 10, or maybe midnight. So in the 1900s, uh, 8.30 is already sleeping time. So you can imagine um, this, this type of cartoon was aired after bedtime. So it was meant for adults. But later on, both um, younger and older, older generations were um, already watching this kind of cartoons. I was able to watch this one, and this is very entertaining. So anyway, um, so that's it for our prehistoric topic. I hope you have learned um, something, learned something new, or maybe recalled this um, past learnings as well. And remember, if you have um, other questions um, about the topics, or if I missed something um, on either of the topics, um, note it down, and we can discuss or talk about them during our Google meeting. All right, so that's it for this week's lesson. And thank you for um, reaching this part here, uh, which means you have the patience to finish this one. So thank you for listening, and I'll be seeing you soon. Goodbye for now.